A cool spring breeze whips through the streets of Berlin. Gunfire largely falls silent. The heart of Germany had collapsed. Hitler was dead, and the war in Europe was, after six years and some 16 million dead, over. By May 2nd, the remaining German garrison within Berlin had surrendered. Both some of Hitler's closest allies, as well as young children and elderly, were some of the last holdouts. Now, with a large portion of the German male population dead, families came from beneath the rubble, which had housed them for weeks, if not years. 600,000 homes had been destroyed, and over half the pre-war inhabitants were still stuck within the city. Sunken eyes darted through Berlin's streets. Sometimes faces were unrecognizable. The city may have been spared the fate of Dresden, but was the very victim of what the bombing of Dresden aimed to avoid, a Soviet ground battle. Despite this, the cool spring air had befallen on a city now ready to move forward. Immediately, the new force in town, the Soviet army, laid foundations to clean up and move on alongside of the populace. German grandmas who had seen both world wars now passed bricks for Soviet soldiers down from medieval structures. A sense of rebirth was on the horizon, but where Germany would go now was still unknown. This first video will cover the often forgotten years between 1945 and the creation of East Germany in 1949. Subsequent videos will cover the decades following East Germany and only East Germany. With the war in Europe now over, Britain had appointed a new prime minister. Clement Attlee, and the United States was led by a relatively fresh-faced president, Harry Truman, as well as the longtime leader, Joseph Stalin of the USSR. These big three were the new faces of Europe, and through the Potsdam Agreement, two months after a Berlin ceasefire, would carve what may have been considered temporary solutions to the rebuilding of Germany. A new map was drawn as the collaborative governments revived a Germany that had experienced years of conflict. But also, this new agreement acted as a vector to hold those who perpetrated the systematic killing of innocent civilians accountable. For the sake of this video, I will not be discussing the Nuremberg Trials, but in the first year of this reconstruction, they played a valuable piece in the removal of both the Nazis and the militaristic past of Germany. These trials convicted some of those that orchestrated the systematic killings of minority groups like Jews, or tried those who had committed war crimes amongst other horrific actions. The Potsdam Agreement and Nuremberg Trials drew the framework of the collective memory of Germany for both sides. Germany was to be held accountable, but not to be held to the same level of deconstruction as the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. The core of the Nazi regime were to be hanged or imprisoned, while steps were made to help alleviate Germany in the eyes of a new cooperative Europe. Germany now looked like this after the agreement. France, Britain, and America were to observe the western half of Germany, while the east was observed by the Soviets. Berlin was to remain divided, with the Allies controlling Western Berlin and the Soviets the East. For now, it was clear things could escalate, but there were more important matters. And in fact, people like Stalin would continue to support the idea of a united Germany. With this contextualization over, let us focus on the topic at hand, East Germany. Or as it was known between 1945 through 1949, the Soviet occupation zone of Germany. This was not yet East Germany although I will be referring to it as such. But this temporary fix was aimed at reviving Germany within the zone and possibly even preparing it for unification. The new government was built with taking the past and using it to move forward to the present. This first year was devoted to two main factors, rebuilding and accountability. Although the accounting for Nazi atrocities within Eastern Germany was a legal battle, the Soviet NKVD, which was the Soviet Ministry for Internal Affairs, also took physical responses to the two main groups, the Junkers and their guarded and estate members. The responses taken and how accountable each person was varied greatly. The Junkers were the remaining nobility from the Prussian monarchy, who, according to Soviet ideology, were the bourgeoisie of Germany. Hundreds of farms stretching from eastern Prussia to Saxony were seeded into communal farms. This was no small task. Hundreds of thousands of acres now went to public farming rather than the militaristic class that represented old monarchical Germany. The NKVD up until the formation of East Germany, orchestrated mass raids on Nazis, otherwise referred to as NSDAP. The validity of these fascists being fascists does remain unclear. Nonetheless, the NKVD used former concentration camps, as well as other areas, to form 10 fascist prisoner camps. Of the 150,000 detained, 43,000 died, mostly to poor food-related illness. These camps were still in control when East Germany was formed but the new government avoided Western outrage by trying the prisoner. When Western outrage reached its height in 1948, many were sent to gulags in Siberia or Central Asia. Although this liquidation process was harsh by Western standards, the Soviets had lost 15% of its pre-war population. According to the Soviets, these prisoners may have assisted in the scorched earth policy that left much of the Soviet countryside a barren wasteland. Ironically, one of the camps, Buchenwald, 
was also used in this liquidation of fascists and would later become a sort of pilgrimage site for Soviets and Germans alike, as the camp was one of the few where its Jewish victims rebelled against the fascists. In some twist of fate, this camp was later a marching ground for East German soldiers as a sign of respect for the apparent Jewish anti-fascist struggle. These Soviet prisoner camps are one of the most controversial points of the entire history of East Germany, and marked both the new conditions of this fresh-faced Germany and its relations to its Nazi past. The NKVD also marked a scary outlook for the role of secret police within East Germany. East Germany, as we'll later come to learn, was taking notes of this period. In fact, in 1945 and 1946, the beginning of East Germany began to form through the Soviet military administration in Germany, otherwise known as ESMAD. ESMAD took Soviets and communist Germans alike and formed an administrative government. The tactics passed directly from Soviet to German in relation to use of police forces and other tactics. The NKVD in this early period worked closely with ESMAD. Shortly thereafter, the NKVD would evolve into the historic MVD, which was and is the Ministry of Internal Affairs for the Soviet Union and Russia. ESMAD is vital for the understanding of East Germany in these early years. They were more than just a temporary government. They were the Stalinist model in the flesh, and they would change names, but they never left East Germany for the rest of its existence. ESMAD had a strange introduction. It was mostly made up of both Soviets and newly founded SED members. Now the SAD, standing for the Socialist Unified Party of Germany, was the main political organization of East German politics, and it would dissolve in 1989. SED was the political representation of ESMAD within East Germany, and the SAD is where things got real interesting for East Germany in these early years. The SAD itself was pretty much a forced party. Stalin knew the threat of having former fascist countrymen under his wing. However, before we understand the SAD, we first also have to understand the geography of East Germany, which was the crux of its existence. East Germany did not have the industry of the West. The Ruhr Valley was the heart of the energy industry of Germany and was mostly ruled by the British occupational forces. Raw materials that were dug up in the West and refined in the East now just went westward or sprung up new industry. The factories of East Germany were useless. Also, East Germany was now cut off from the former farms of Poland and East Prussia. Now East Germany was five states. The first was Mecklenburg and Brandenburg, which were extremely rural, as they still are. And so these two states remained heavily conservative. On the other end of things, you had Thuringia, Saxony, and Saxony-Anhalt. These were largely made up of old German socialists. I'm talking Karl Marx days, or 1919 socialists. These socialists and conservatives posed a big threat in the eyes of Stalin. So the KPD, or Communist Party of Germany, formed strange relationships with the Soviet body, and its members were given high statuses and jobs within East Germany. It was then forcibly decided that the SPD, the Socialists, were to unite with the KPD to form the SED. This was highly controversial and divisive. The Socialists were practically forced into joining forces with the Communists. At the same time, SMAD allowed for liberal and conservative oppositional parties to help ease the tension. The leader of the KPD was a man named Wilhelm Pieck a renowned communist of his day, and in close association with a very infamous East German, Otto Ubrich, who would later become the first leader of East Germany. The SED may have united with the socialists, but tensions were still high. To combat this, the Soviets chose the hardline route and manufactured groups and enforced ideology to combat the socialists. Firstly, they propped up former KPD members to the highest positions, especially to a few new groups such as the Free German Youth, or FDJ. <laughs> as well as the Free German Trade Union. Just as a side note, the FDJ was given to a leader by the name of Eric Honecker, who would later become the second leader of East Germany after Ubrich. These two guys led East Germany until 1989. Ubrich and Honecker, as you will learn, grew during this period into the mainstream and would pretty much be the sole puppet heads of East Germany until its collapse. The Soviets also encouraged both Soviets and communists from abroad to join the SED, with a hardline ideology being formed in a former great power. Communists from Palestine, the United States, Mexico, Switzerland, and even West Germany came in to practice Stalinism in East Germany. This also gave the SED control over the newly formed Volkspolizei in March of 1946, 60% of whom 
or a part of the KPD. Despite this sudden transition, it was not all bad. The SAD did a fair amount to continue Germany and uplift its people. The organizations created gave a new sense of purpose. On top of this, the market was decided to remain free in this period, and there would be a new sense of rebirth among the people. Germany would rise from the ruins into a new country, and old woes were to be overcome, and the people together would create a better life without the class divisions of the old militaristic Germany. Of course, the accuracy of this statement is up to you. I personally believe that East Germany really did have the best in mind, but the relation with the Soviets constantly created an inner misunderstanding of what it meant to be German. However, the blame for this is on both of the parties, both the Soviets and East Germans. As I said earlier, Stalin himself said Germany should be united, not under a communist system, but under a socialist one. German cultural life, both in this period and beyond, brought the classic German historical notions of rebirth. East Germany and the potentially united Socialist Germany was an enormous chance for the ideologies of the 1800s to revive again. Luther and the German Reformation came to mind once more, and Germany began to rethink itself within its body and on the world stage. This all comes after the liquidation of the Junkers that plagued the country since the Prussian period. Schiele and Goeth of the Weimar Republic were reread, and old universities and musical identities rebirthed amidst the rubble. In some ways, what we know as the conflict now between East and West Germany were more of a reaction to each other. West Germany would cut all rail lines and embargo East Germany, just as much as East Germany would attempt to starve out Western Berlin. As Joseph Stalin said, this war is not as in the past. Whoever occupies the territory also imposes on it his own social system. Everyone imposes his own system as far as his army can reach. It cannot be otherwise. Anyways, that practically wraps up the most important years of 1945 to 1946, and into 1947. I had to start the series with a lot of contextualization. Now I will briefly cover the rest of 1947 to 1949, when East Germany was officially established. A lot of this period is taking pre-made organizations from the early years and using them to rebuild Germany, and the conflict in this period really began to define the Cold War in Germany. In 1947 in Munich, for instance, East German Socialists proposed a plan for a Socialist German administration for both East and West Germany. SED members were often talking with superiors on the off chance of bringing these ideas to the negotiation tables, but nothing came of it. From a Soviet perspective, East Germany was a relatively democratic country. They had parties of multiple ideologies competing for power. However, as you know, this was mostly a farce as the East German political makeup was overwhelmingly biased and supportive of the dominant SED. In the Soviet eyes though, this was far more democratic and was not under the same influence as what they viewed as an imperialist influenced West Germany. However, it was not just the Soviets and even the Germans yearning for unification in this period. Some American politicians also supported reunification as a sort of buffer zone between powers. As a unified Germany, even if socialist, could hopefully give way for some sort of democratic process, especially under the SPD. But even though Stalin preached to the Allies over unification, he was enforcing a state that was adopting his forms of control. East Germans were under constant surveillance. Membership in the party was the only way for you to rise up within the ranks of East Germany. East Germans in this early period were subject to insane work quotas with little leeway, despite having a much older and less industrial country, one third of the population of the West. Any intelligent East German could also just cross pretty much the open border into the west if they had the right contacts, as there was no wall yet. Throughout 1947, SMAD continued to make strides for consolidations of East Germany, and by 1948, things really started to ramp up. Their early administration started to turn into governments. By summer of 1948, strikes in West Germany resulted in the replacement of previous currencies with the Deutschmark, wiping out pretty much all West German debt and suffocating East German economic ties in the process. To prevent this move towards the West, East German government set up blocks from Allied territory to Berlin, essentially suffocating West Berlin from the outside world. This would result in the Berlin Airlift, where until the removal of the blockade in 1949, the West dropped 3,400 tons of food and supplies into Berlin each day. This made the SMAD government look terrible, and suffocating West Berliners from food was terrible for a global understanding of the new government. If the fledgling East German government could do this, the West was concerned whatever lengths they would go to next. By this time, the areas of West and East Germany became clear, and the role of Berlin became solidified. There was no room for unification anymore. And so, with the West eager to get West Germany into military and economic alliances, they formed the Federal Republic of Germany, or FRG, in May of 1949. Shortly thereafter, in October of the same year, East Germany, or the German Democratic Republic, was formed. The players had been made, 
and the countries who backed them had been solidified. Militarization was rising at the border, and Berlin had been a flashpoint. A once unified people, eager for unification, were now birthing new nations with new identities in a clear conflict with each other. And that concludes the video on the prelude to East Germany. I'm hoping to make a series of this, and soon enough here I'll be in Berlin, and so I hope to combine the two to make more accurate and more effective content. Using on-the-ground footage and maybe even my face, hopefully this will make my content more accessible to new viewers. I have to apologize for not recording in a very long time, but uh, I'm now entering my junior year of college, and so things have really started to ramp up. That being said, I hope to see you soon, and I really want to make a series on this, so um, yeah, I hope to see you soon, and thanks again for watching.